Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is our latest in a series of staff engagement sessions around the new building. Um, some of us go to an awful lot of meetings about the new building and feel the last thing we want to do is hear more about it, but I'm aware that some of you are a little bit more distant to the whole process and so would like to know what's happening. So this is meant to be an interactive session. Um, we want to tell you what's happening, but equally if you have burning questions, just shout out and we'll attempt to answer them. So I'm going to give you just a general overview of what's happening. Uh, Kate O'Donnell is going to tell you about the work we're just starting on organizational culture change, um, to think about how this new building can be used to bring us together properly as a multidisciplinary institute. Hamish is going to tell you a bit more um, about the teaching spaces, and Sarah is going to tell you more about the ground floor and the knowledge exchange, public engagement, and exhibition space. Okay, so that is the latest picture of your building, as it will look, uh, the Claris Pears building, so-called because we got a nice £5 million donation from the Pears Foundation. Um, the shape is similar to what you've seen before. It's been slightly tweaked uh, by the building's approval people. They wanted the top floor edges rounded a little bit, which causes all sorts of problems, but we finally have approval for that building as you see it. And that's a view from Byers Road. So what are the timelines? Um, it feels we've had, had, a, had to get approval from everybody. I think we've now finally run out of people to approve this building. Uh, so we got formal council planning approval on 22nd of October. The plot became available to the building contractors at the end of October, and they're now finally actually starting work on the site. And I can give you photographic evidence that they have actually started. <laughs> So if everything goes to plan, and we'll do our best to make sure it does, um, the construction will be completed in summer of 2021. People can start moving in at that date, and we hope to have everybody in the building and the building fully operational by autumn of the same year. So there you are, very exciting things actually happening on sites. Um, the first thing is to put big uh, metal uh, piling into the ground, which will help to keep the building up, which is reassuring. Um, it seems to me there's an obvious opportunity there for a bit of abseiling and fundraising, but I haven't yet got approval for that, so it's not official. <laughs> and as you can see, that's a recent photo because you'll recognise the sky from yesterday. <laughs> so this is the aerial view. Uh, this was taken a short while ago when they were digging holes just to check that there are no um, nasty toxic stuff or dead bodies or anything else under the ground. So the red outline is where our building will be. This yellow bit up here, this will all be a public square. So if you're standing on Byers Road, the first thing you will see of the campus is our building. So this is a view as you see it from Byers Road and then moving down. This is the major route into the campus from Byers Road. So this is the main pathway that you will go down along past our building. There have been a few tweaks to the design since you last saw it. So these sort of... Um, saw edge type um, features on the windows. Um, they're not just for aesthetics. They're partly to ensure that we get as much natural light as we can whilst making sure that we don't get a lot of solar gain. We're keen that the building is environmentally friendly, so we're trying to avoid mechanical ventilation as much as we can. Uh, up on the top floor, for the health and safety reasons, we've got a barrier so that nobody can accidentally fall off it. Plenty of good signage at the bottom. This is a view from the south side. This, so this is coming up from Dumbarton Road. There's a nice big plaza at the bottom, and then you go up towards our building. So there's another secondary entrance there on the south side. One of the things that's changed since we last showed you the building is this bit along the back here was going to be a lane between us and the chronic diseases building. The chronic diseases building is not going ahead at this stage, so it's been made to look like a much more um, formal side of the building. It's no longer a back lane, but will be much more open and visible. So something else that's happened since the last time, um, we are keen that our building um, looks and interacts with people in a way that's different to other buildings because we like to be different in a, in a good way. So one of the features of our building is that it's um, covered in anodized aluminium metal panels and one option with those panels is that you can actually put decorative features on the building. So all the other buildings on the campus will be plain monoliths, we're keen that ours looks a little bit different. So we have engaged with um, some Glasgow, um, a Glasgow design company. We went through um, a tenure procedure and ended up with this company that's got young Glaswegians in it that we're keen to support. The design that we've gone through, we were keen that it was uh, future-proof, so um, fairly abstract. 
Um, some of the designs we saw were a little bit feminine and we wanted something that was gender neutral. We wanted something that could be interpreted in different ways that were consistent with what um, we're about in our building. So we have gone for this pattern. Whoops. The story behind the pattern, um, this sort of bike saddle shape icon in the middle is actually the shape of Glasgow city centre. So one way of interpreting the designs is that what we do impacts on Glasgow city, but it also then rolls out and has an impact at a wider national and international level. There are also lots of other ways you can interpret it. It could be a cross section of wood and we're interested in natural environment. It could be an ordnance survey map and we're interested in spatial and health inequalities. Um, it could be lots of lines joining up and connectivity, multidisciplinary working. So basically, any way you look at it, we can make an incredibly good story about it. So we can have a nice plaque in the foyer. And this will feature at the three corners of the building. So it will look something like this. Ignore the funny reeds on the top. That's not going to happen. This is an old photograph. But it shows you how the patterns will appear at that corner of the building. Um, and this is just a schema that shows it a different scale. So some, some corners will have an awful lot of the pattern. Other corners will have more windows, so it'll be less of a prominent feature. There is a potential to take this branding inside the building so it can be consistent. Um, and we can use it on the walls that segregate rooms. We can also use that patterning to try and provide some privacy. And we can even take it one step further and look at things like color coding of different zones. So if you're a visitor coming into a new building, it's quite easy to come off the stairs or out of the escalator and get a little bit lost, but at least you can see immediately you're in the blue zone and you should be in the green zone or whatever. So it's actually quite a good way to compartmentalize a large building. And there is a potential to go ridiculously crazy and have it everywhere, but we'll try to restrain ourselves and not go silly. Furthermore, just thinking commercially, we can even go into branding. <laughs> Um, so when we have our conferences and our knowledge exchange events, we can put it on our notepads, we can put it on our eco-friendly uh, bags, etc., and possibly even have some income generation for the building. Who knows? The sky's the limit. Um, I'm not going to go in detail through the floor pans. You've seen these before, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about technical development that will enable you to see a bit better around the building. But basically, the ground floor level one, Sarah's going to tell you a little bit more about publicly accessible, a mixture of teaching and meeting rooms, and along this side here, very open, visible from outside, cafe and exhibition space. Levels two and three are um, office accommodation and meeting rooms, all deliberately around the perimeter of the building. Uh, so you get a lot of natural light, and then more open areas here uh, with kitchen space, sitting down and formal space, etc. So that's those two levels. Level four will house the SPHSU. Um, they've opted for a more open plan format. And then finally, the very top floor is a mixture of Robertson Centre down this, oops, Robertson Centre down this side and along here. Uh, the PHRF, which is a mixture of Robertson Centre and SPHSU, and some more teaching and meeting rooms at this end. Now, the reason I'm flying through that is because we are investing within our existing budget and a little bit of new technology. Um, so this will enable you to effectively have a fly through the building and explore it a little bit more, which you can either do, if you're like me, a technical pedant at your laptop, or you can go crazy with your VR headsets and actually walk around and imagine going through the building. So we have paid for this to be done for levels one, two, four, and five. Two and three are very similar, so it wasn't worth the extra costs. It should be available to you from the beginning of 2020. Um, and it will look at different zones in the building. So again, for an ec economic reasons, there are certain zones you'll be able to go into in very much detail and walk around and look at all the nooks and crannies, other bits that you'll be able to see but won't be able to explore in as much detail. And the aim of that is it will enable you to get a better understanding of your building. It will help us in this latest phase in terms of making sure that how we're going to use it and the sort of furniture we're putting in it makes sense. We're not putting in something that blocks the light or gets in the way of access. The sort of things that are very difficult to tell from a 2D plan. It will help with marketing. We want to be able to tell other people about this exciting development and we'll be able to offer them links where they can go on and have a look through the building. It will help for marketing it for other people that might want to come in and use the facilities, etc. So once we have this in place fairly soon, you'll be able to see the building much more for yourselves. So that is the end of my fly through of the building. 
I'm going to pass on to Kate, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how we want to make sure that we take this fantastic opportunity to take our now 10, I think, I don't think we're quite up to 11 yet, <laughs> 10 different buildings with all our different disciplines and bring them together in a way that actually maximizes our multidisciplinary work. So I'm going to hand over to Kate. Kate. Hey. I think um, the first thing I'll say actually for, because most people might not know this, um, where the, the Clarence Pears building is going to be and where I think hopefully I will end my career unless the university or Jill have um, other thoughts, uh, is actually where I also started as well, because the building that got knocked down was the immunology building where I was an undergraduate student and also a postgrad. Um, and I really wanted to help knock the building down, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> um, so, hang on. What I want to have the opportunity to raise today and also to give yourselves um, some time, if we're going to try and do some more question and answers at the end, I'll probably not have quite used quite so much time um, at this point, but is to actually get uh, all of us here starting to think about um, what it's going to take when we move into this new building and what we need to be planning for um, to move forward. And initially, uh, when Jill said, would I sort of take on the, the work around operationalization and culture change, she sold it to me on it. Well, it's really just about bringing together multiple seminar series, which seemed all right. And then I had a conversation with Martin and realized there was a lot more uh, in, in that that we need to start thinking about. So although this has been a, a theme of work that we haven't really talked about much um, beforehand, I think it will be something that will we'll really start to develop um, going forward into 2020 and then preparing us uh, for our move in, in 21. So why is it important? Well, we've seen the nice pictures and we'll see the nice CGIs eventually. But in many ways, I think for a lot of us, our new space is a box. We know there are you know, five, lay five floors in it. We know there's going to be really interesting stuff taking place in the bottom and the ground floor that Sarah will talk about. We know they'll be teaching, but actually we're probably still sort of thinking about how, how we're going to come together and fit in this. <coughs> and I think it's also really important to remember what we are at the moment as an institute. So we have, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different groupings. Um, some of those, like ourselves in general practice, we're in one sort of site, admittedly over two houses, but we're in one site, public health in one site, mental health and well-being over at least three sites, maybe four. Um, social scientists, obviously based within College of, of Social Sciences, um, social and public health sciences in, in the city centre. So we've got a number of different groups, and yes, we come together and we, we, you know, there are shared activities, etc. but we are still quite um, you know, a multiple um, number of different groupings and different ways of working. We then have our three research themes, and all of the groups work across all of the research themes, but maybe there's different sort of emphasis depending where we're sitting and the work that we're doing. Jill's already mentioned we've got multiple sites. We've got probably at least 10 different sites. Um, and someone said to me, well, you know, you've got a nice building. You might be a bit sorry to leave, but people are out in Gartnavel, for example, might be you know, champing at the bit to get out of, of some of the, the places in Gartnavel. So there's challenges about that. And then there's all of the different levels as well. So people working in different ways and different job families at different grades. And I think Everyone's going to have their own kind of issues and concerns. We know when um, admin and support staff went through some of this um, at their away day, um, there's a range of issues. So I get the sense in talking to people already that people are really looking forward to the new building. But there are some um, issues and clearly some tensions and probably some worries about moving forward as well. So I think we want to start thinking about all of that and addressing those in advance. Uh, but also then starting to think about what we already do well as an institute, how we can build on that and use that to take us forward. So when we land in that shiny new space, we're up and ready for it. There are things that we already do. So it's not as if we're all in our own little silos and we don't talk to each other. There's a lot of collaborative research goes on across the institute. We have really successful research away day. The admin and support staff have an away day. 
Athena Swan, I think, has been really important and a really good example of where the kind of glass sort of floors and ceilings between the different parts of the Institute have disappeared and we've worked very much as an institute um, taking forward our Athena Swan remit. And the work around knowledge exchange and public engagement, I think, is another area where that is happening and that we can start to think about and where we can build on. So there's a lot of real positives and real strengths, I think, in terms of how we work already that we want to really harness and then take forward um, to actually moving together into this new building. So I didn't use many slides for this. I think today is an opportunity to really start that conversation across the Institute. So obviously here today, we've got people from all, all, every part of the Institute, from all of the different job families across the Institute. And I think it's a really good opportunity for us to start thinking um, about what we want to do. What do we want to do differently? What kind of activities, um, perhaps building in some of the things we're already doing, but perhaps also completely new things that we haven't thought about? It might be around collaborative working. It might be around areas of particular interest. It could be around sort of social activities. How do we want to think about working together? What sort of things are going to help bring us together? Um, seminar series and the process of, of thinking about how we start to bring those together across the, the, the various separate strands that we have at the moment, I think is one sort of obvious thing to be thinking about but there's likely to be other areas and other things that we can draw on and start to think about. What do you feel are the opportunities in terms of, of moving into the new building? What excites you about moving into the new building? But what are maybe also the challenges? What are some of the things that might start to concern you? Right, um, yeah, so one of the other work streams under the Project Delivery Board is uh, being focused on learning and teaching spaces. And so Jim and I are going to um, cover some of the issues that have come out of that. Um, it's probably three main areas of um, concern and, and uh, issues that have been addressed. Um, firstly, about the environment for the teaching space and the functionality of it, and then some of the flexibility in terms of the different ways in which the space is going to be uh, need to be used. And you sort of know um, all of you who have got contact with teaching programs within the institute that we've got a pretty varied portfolio of teaching that requires different kinds of activities. Uh, with different class sizes and, and group sizes um, and uh, different types of learning activities needed in, in terms of uh, more active learning versus more seminar and lecture style learning. So the um, main area in this interface is with Sarah's um, public engagement group as well, but the main area for larger group teaching is um, on the ground floor or uh, level one as it has been confusingly labelled. Um, uh, is the main uh, large spaces are in here and then there's smaller spaces for teaching and meeting rooms around here. And we modelled um, this on the assumption that the larger spaces are going to be used for teaching for our larger classes but also for public engagement events and some of these physical features of the environment are um, configured so they can open out and have more flow between the um, atrium and that kind of thing. And then the uh, recurrent concern particularly for those people who did block teaching and had people in a room for long periods of time um, uh, and where the environment you know it, um, it can be pretty wearing if you're in a, um, a room without much natural light and all those kinds of things there was lots of consideration about how to make the rooms as comfortable for longer periods of teaching as possible so the uh, room size the um, availability of natural light the various IT capacity and the um, uh, types of furniture that are put into those rooms have all gone into the mix of the current levels of recommendation. Some of the final decisions about furniture are still ongoing so, and there's a um, provider commissioned to work with us on making sure that the um, physical furniture uh, is the best uh, going to meet those needs. And I think the uh, virtual reality rendering of the environment that Jill mentioned will also help with um, getting a sense prior to the building actually being built about how those um, features of the physical environment work and whether or not there's any obvious problems that are better to find out before the actual uh, real building emerges. Um, and we've tried as best as we can to think about all current and expected future use cases. Um, although I'll admit that there are some things that we uh, have to be a bit um, uh, 
real about in terms of not knowing quite how teaching technology and other things will change. So the standard pro approach of having to have a, a physical computer on, everyone on desks in a, in a sort of IT lab may no longer be um, the standard mode of practice in five years' time where everyone brings their own device and those kinds of things. So we've tried to keep some flexibility to manage those aspects of the environment. Then the functionality, this is, um, at, the, at this stage of the game, we haven't got um, totally accurate renderings of the internal building. So this one was just a mock-up um, in terms of what the uh, teaching space would look like. But if this is uh, looking into this kind of area here. Um, but as you can see, the, the principle is that um, in the open mode, there's a, a space for about 100 people. In closed mode, there'll be space in the two larger rooms for about 50 people, um, access to natural light. Um, the furniture configuration will allow both uh, seminar and lecture style layout as well as more active, interactive uh, learning modes. Um, and the um, IT advice from the university, the standard um, packages will um, be set up to have um, visualization, uh, people be able to bring their own device and log into the local network and, and interact um, as needed. So those things will be um, provided in line with the university standard policies and the support um, will be, as far as I understand, is going to be supported by the um, university IT, which for remote um, uh, sites like Gart Naval and other periods which are a bit out of the ambit of standard IT support will, uh, that'll change in, the, in a good way. And then a final concern about um, functionality and getting access to rooms. Uh, obviously, space may be, um, there may be some competition in terms of uh, growth over time, but um, we've had reassurance that there are systems available and there'll be policies in place to ensure electronic booking um, gives prior, um, primary uh, priority to in, um, IHW activities first and make sure that there's um, access to the rooms rather than having people being sent off all over campus to other venues for teaching. And Jim was going to um, uh, talk about flexibility of functioning. Thank you, Hamish. Yes, so um, as Hamish has outlined, we, we're not exactly sure how we're going to fu future-proof these teaching rooms. So we have definitely focused on uh, flexibility and that none more so is that appropriate than for this uh, room here, which we're kind of stylizing as a kind of an IT cafe possibly at the moment. And going back to Jill's very opening picture of what the building looks like, this is a very prominent position. Uh, as you look from Byers Road, it will be the, um, the glass fronted room that you can initially see. Um, so in terms of uh, its use, um, a variety of teaching could take place here, but um, predominantly it would be kind of computer lab based uh, teaching where we have uh, projections onto this wall here. Um, obviously the glass will pre present uh, difficulties for projection in other parts of the room. So this will uh, be mitigated by having uh, like 55 inch LCD monitors at strategic points in the room or as Hamish alluded to, if we actually have a sort of a bring your own laptop uh, scheme or fold away uh, monitors, then people will be able to uh, do share screen uh, with, um, with the presenter. Um, in terms of the room configuration, uh, as you can see, we've got sort of two blocks of uh, seven here and then a larger table here. Um, these tables can be uh, refigured, so it could be like four blocks of seven. Uh, but the, as I understand it, the, the furniture won't be able to, to leave the room, but it can be uh, reconfigured. So other uses, as well as sort of traditional teaching and computing labs, uh, we see this as a, a place that obviously it's not going to be a good look for our new uh, building if it's just lying empty as people are passing, going into the main uh, part of the uh, of the plaza. So we want to make it an attractive place for uh, PhD students to meet, PhD students to meet their supervisors. We could also host um, CPD events in there. Um, uh, so I can imagine a variety of things that uh, we do in HETO you could host in there. Um, also, we've, in terms of the research themes, we've had data science 
um, presentations which run through like prescribing information systems again and it's kind of demonstrator led so I, I think um, activities like that would be uh, really uh, useful um, so what I'd be really keen to hear uh, and Hamish as well is how could we maximize the use in this this key room in terms of its its visibility um, the IT cafe kind of idea uh, I'm not I don't think final decisions have been made, but there was also talk of we could have soft furnishings around the perimeter of the room uh, to encourage people when it's not in use just to come and take uh, quiet time, sit on the, their laptop and so on. Um, and yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's that. So in any ideas about how to maximize the, the use of this room, uh, please do get in, get in touch. I'll pass on to Sarah. So you've heard a bit about, so the whole of the ground floor is open to the public. Um, and the idea is that we make it uh, look busy. We want it to look busy and inviting and have people come along. Um, and so uh, the work stream that I'm involved in has been planning this engagement space over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, and there's three main components to that. Um, and the first is the community engagement kind of resource hub. There's a temporary exhibit space and there's a permanent exhibition space. And uh, these are um, colleagues who've been working with me on uh, pulling that all together. And you can see that they're from across the, the Institute at the moment. Um, but we're, we always welcome new members if anybody would like to join us. Um, so I'll talk a bit about each of those so the idea behind the community engagement resource hub space was that the institute would be um, welcoming um, for all of the communities that we currently collaborate with. And um, in our individual groups, we collaborate with lots of different organisations from third sector organisations, patient groups, right up to government. Um, and the key is, is that we are to be active and trusted members of our local community and that we can be a good neighbour, kind of within the ethos of the civic university, that we, we want to be good neighbours, we want to offer something to the community in which we are. And so the key with the, the community engagement resource hub is to collaborate and connect with local residents and organisations, and I use that in the widest um, kind of Glasgow West of Scotland sense, and our research partners to develop this engagement strategy. And through that, we'll have a programme of events and activities that will bring people to the building. And our emphasis is on those people who don't normally use the university. And to facilitate that, we're currently looking at kind of stakeholder mapping, the kind of organisations that we currently work with and looking at any particular gaps. And then um, in the coming kind of 12 months, there's a series of planned discussions with some large umbrella organisations like the Glasgow Centre um, Council for Voluntary Services, the Alliance that we already get involved with, um, Engage, Renfrewshire. These are kind of umbrella organisations, the Third Sector Research Forum, um, who have um, a role for um, having third sector organisations discreetly revolved, involved in research. So discussions with all of them about the kind of things that we can offer organisations and partners externally. And so far we've got a range of ideas, so um, skill sharing workshops, lots of organisations require and need some help with some research ideas, um, you know, writing a grant potentially, you know, there's organisations applying for lottery funding and that kind of thing. These are skills that we have and could pass on actually um, to um, our third sector partners. Um, some training for PPI, research training for PPI membership, that's patient public involvement um, and other community groups. So we can have kind of uh, some research training, you know, what's the different types of research? Because we ask the public to be involved in the research process, but often don't underpin that with any kind of skills for them to get involved in that. Um, and just general information sessions or workshops responsive to local needs, but crucially building up a partner partnerships with those community organisations over the next few months. Um, so this is on the, so that will be a kind of virtual, there, there will also be a meeting space for community organisations to use for free, so we can, we'll allow them to use that, but obviously our activities will take um, priority, but we'll try and organise a way in which 
perhaps you know one Monday or two Mondays in a month that organisations can use our facilities for free or at least a meeting space because when we speak to community organisations that's one of the things is they can just never get free meeting space even a church hall can cost you money but if we can I know that they then have to come to the West End but what we want to do is to um, have many opportunities for people to come so to that end we have a small temporary exhibit space which is also on the ground floor um, and this space is really to provide a place to showcase some of our work in a creative way um, and this can be we've we've organized it so that it can be quite traditionally museum like but also potentially with mixed media if that's um, how we want it and thinking about that really in collaboration with external partners so it's probably easier if I give you an example so just this morning um, we had a meeting with a PhD student who's looking to do some work on um, a, fo a, a, um, a study that uses photographs, photo elicitation with um, a, a community group and we're thinking about a way that we can actually showcase that at the end of it and at the moment what we would have to do would be to go and find somewhere to do that, find somewhere accessible and then get everybody to come to wherever that was but actually the building offers the opportunity for us to have that space within the building so there will also be collaboration with external partners. So for example, in this case, it would be the Mental Health Foundation. Um, and then that will then align. We, the other thing is that we can, at the moment, we can't respond often to external events. So just say we have um, iWrite is coming to Glasgow. Um, we could have something that's happening within iWrite in the building. We, don't, we currently don't have the scope to do that. But we can also have themed internal events around about this space. So just for example, if that student was showing their work, then we might have seminars that were around um, refugee week, that kind of thing. So just tying all of that in together in a kind of coherent space. Um, and we envisaged, <laughs> um, but we still have to work this out, um, that these will change every kind of four to six months and that we'll encourage teams to apply to us um, application through kind of inst um, the institute-wide systems so you decide that you want to do a piece of work within that space think about a seminar series round about it and then apply to a committee who will of volunteers that we haven't yet um, earmarked for that <laughs> but, uh, um, and then that will move on like that and we'll change it every um, kind of four to six months but that gives us all a way of being able to showcase the, the different work that we do um, at the moment, I think we've kind of got our thinking caps on about the opening exhibit, which we think <laughs> needs to be um, uh, impressive. <laughs> and one of the things we're currently talking about is the history, kind of public population health in Glasgow. Uh, Gillian has been talking to the archivist at the university, and we've got links with the archivist at NHS. And so that sort of thing is, is what we're thinking about. So that's the temporary exhibit space and maybe I'm leaving the most exciting to last um, and this is an ongoing partnership we have with the Glasgow Science Centre and we've been talking with them for probably about 12 months um, to think about how they might take our work and translate our work into tangible themes with hands-on activities so in the ground floor um, uh, so the triangle there's the teaching space down that side that bit there um, that is the public engagement space and within that we'll have three or four permanent exhibits um, that have been designed by the Science Centre and we hope that they will facilitate the community resource hub so for example um, we may have a map of health <coughs> indicators either Glasgow, Scotland, the world um, but when, the, when we have events that include the communities coming in um, skills sharing then that will actually facilitate that so if they want to know something about active travel within their postcode area we'll be able to get that quite quickly from something that we already have from the science center so that way it kind of joins up and um, the other things we're talking about are things like ask, ask the expert or uh, ways to understand evidence or measure health those kind of um, things that we can update fairly easily uh, but um, are future proof because we don't want um, it to be something that we have to keep changing um, every few months so having the balance of the permanent and the temporary exhibition space should hopefully do that I mean it, it is um, 
it is really exciting. I've got some pictures uh, from the Science Centre. So rather than thinking about the Science Centre as, you know, this is somewhere that people come with their kids, um, this is the outpatients department at the kids' hospital down at Queen Elizabeth, and the Science Centre designed this. So rather than us, this is, people will, I don't think we're thinking that people will come to the building to see the Science Centre exhibit. The people will come to the building for other things and the Science Centre exhibit will be there. Um, and we want it to be exciting and, and useful and all the rest of it. So it's probably a bit more like the waiting room than it is the actual Science Centre, but probably somewhere in between. But this is the, the kids' hospital, so you can see the way that they've designed that. Um, they've also designed, uh, if I can get it, so they were commissioned by a school, um, a primary school in the Glasgow area to design a STEM hub. So it's this kind of thing. So they're going to be working in broad themes over the course of the next six months. We'll come up with um, probably less than that, uh, uh, three to four months. We'll come up with a series of themes that will allow them to start designing this kind of infrastructure. We obviously decide on the content of that, but they design the, the infrastructure. Um, and there's a kind of classic body works. Um, so one of the things that they, they will do is that they'll be at our research away day in February and um, they'll get a feel for what we do and then they'll make some suggestions around the key themes that time fit all of the Institute's work rather than um, small parts of it. Um, and yeah, it is, it's a um, it's really exciting opportunity to get involved with the Science Centre and work with them in this way. So um, I guess from, from your point of view, it would be great to have more people involved. At the moment, we are a small um, and select group, but um, any other volunteers to help would be great, particularly as we move forward with the three different components to trying to sort them out. It's quite a big job for just four or five of us. Um, so anybody that would like to join the Workstream group, they'd be more than welcome. Uh, I would encourage you to speak with people at, from the Science Centre when that opportunity arises at the away day, just to give them your thoughts and ideas. Um, external collaborations. Um, if you can tell us who you already have for our stakeholder mapping, then that would be helpful. And consider pitching an idea, get in, the, in there early for the exhibit space after our opening exhibit, or indeed thinking about something that we could have for the opening exhibition. So, thanks.